the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals and more, honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Charles B. Brownson, United States Representative from Indiana. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Congressman Brownson, our Chronoscope audience knows you as the young freshman congressman, a Republican from Indiana, who was so instrumental in defeating the uh, Universal Military Training Bill. Now, we all know that the bill has been defeated, but we hear rumors that it's not quite dead and that there may be more uh, news, more activity from that direction. Could you update us on that, sir? Yes, I think I can. As a matter of fact, last week when I was taking the elevator up to the House Chambers, I happened to ride with Carl Vinson, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. That time he told me, quite off the record, that uh, he felt that he would be out with a new UMT bill, which would be so modified that even I could go for it. Do of course, I had, to, I had to tell him that I doubt that very much, because as long as there's any of that old UMT bill done up in a package, no matter how much cellophane and pink ribbon they put on it, I'm afraid I can't buy that kind of a program. Well, but it shows that they are working on it. Just what's your opposition to the old UMT bill, the administration UMT bill? Oh, yeah, there are a lot of points there, Mr. Rogers. In the first place, it's terribly expensive. The first year will cost over four and a ten, one tenth billion dollars, and after that, it'll cost over two billion dollars a year. The now, two billion dollars. When? The first year would be the first year it's in effect, of course. Uh, Mr. Vinson sort of let the cat out of the bag as to the extent he was willing to go in compromising when he introduced his amendment on the floor of the House to make UMT non-effective until 1955. But the expense is a terrible factor. That two and one-tenths billion dollars, for instance, amounts to more money than it costs to send all of the young men and women in the United States that go through college or university to school. Well, well now, sir, let's simplify this just a bit for our audience. Uh, many of whom have uh, young sons. Now, is it true today, sir, that every young man approaching ev 18, every young American, must anticipate that he'll have to serve some time in military training? I think you're absolutely right, Mr. Huey. Of course, right now, the draft is taking all of the available all right, now whether we call we it have. whether we call it draft or the UMT or whatever we call it, uh, every able-bodied young man has to uh, face some sort of military training now, doesn't he? Right. And uh, so the, uh, your argument, the argument is over what type of military training he's going to get, isn't that it? That is exactly You're right. not opposed to universal no. military training. No, not at all. You're just opposed to the bill. As well, a matter of fact, the issue, I think, is very clear-cut. The issue is that we have to find some way of getting non-veteran reservists to replace the veteran reservists uh, on whom we now depend. But before we get to that point, since every man must face it, and there are two plans now for it. One is the government plan, uh, which is uh, being led or <coughs> by Mr. Vinson, or advocated by Mr. Vinson, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And the other is your plan, or the plan that's been evolved by you and a group of freshman congressmen in the House. Isn't that, that is correct? Right. That's right. Now, uh, how, what are the major differences between the government plan and the plan advocated by the, young, by the freshman congressman? I might put it this way. Ours is uh, evolutionary and theirs is a little revolutionary. We're taking the high school ROTC type of program, which has existed now for many, many years and which now trains 62,000 youngsters all right, now every year in American high school. Number one, their plan would take all young men that go off for training, they'd take them away from home. That is correct. Time. 
Your plan it, a, envisions keeping them at home. We keep them at home where they're subjected to their home environment and the influences of home, church, and school. Would they get no uh, military training at a post, a regular military no, camp? No, not at all, Mr. Rogers, because after their two senior years of high school, their junior and senior year, they are then taken to a six weeks summer camp where they receive training in the particular branch of the service which they have chosen or to which they've been assigned. And presumably they would also receive pay for this six weeks. They do, weeks. that's right. They receive but not pay. As, not as ROTC no. students. Yes. All right, now your plan first would keep them at home more. That is right. Now, what is the second advantage that you The second advantage is we do not interrupt his educational progress. Our plan fits into his summer vacation and his normal high school instruction. A young man who's going to take a long technical course in college isn't faced with the possibility of having to extend his education another year because of UMT. I believe Mr. Benson, as the government spokesman, has called your plan the kindergarten plan. Is that a fair criticism? No, I don't think so, because if my plan is the kindergarten plan, Mr. Vinson and his Committee on Armed Services have been engaging in a lot of kindergarten activity for several years because they have had high school ROTC almost since the National Defense Act of 1917 authorized it. And has the high school ROTC plan been uh, uh, called successful by the military? It has worked very well. Several of the executives on reserve affairs have stated that many of the non-commissioned officers in the early and critical days of World War II and many of the aviation flying cadets were young men who had received their first military training in high school ROTC and who jumped out ahead of the group as a result of that practice. Now, now you want to keep them at home, sir, and you are also, as a congressman, You've been investigating military expenditures. Now, you, will your plan uh, be less expensive for the taxpayer than the plan advocated by the government? We estimate that it'll only cost about 15% as much. For instance, just to give you an example of what's happening right now, in high school and college, the Department of Defense is able to state that they are training 202,141 high school and college ROTC students for a total cost of $20 million. That includes all the instructors, equipment, that type of thing. Out-of-pocket expense is actually running $11.56 a piece a year. All right, now it's now costing... Contrasted to what, sir? Contrasted to the $2,100,000,000 which it will cost to train the trainees under the administration plan, mm -hmm. which calls for one instructor well, for each two trainees. I mean, per student. Now you say this is $11.56 per student? That's eleven fifty-six. Plus about a hundred dollars that comes out of the twenty million. Yes. All right. Now, what would the UMT, the administration's UMT plan, about cost students? About twenty-eight hundred dollars to train one student for six months, which I think is a little high because I understand you can go to Harvard or Yale for eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars for a whole school year very months. comfortably. Yeah, that's right. Now it, it costs twenty-eight hundred dollars for the government to train one young man for six months. That is right. And it cost $1,800 for a young man to go to Harvard for n nine months. That's right. And uh, you, you think that that's too much money. I think something is wrong. I think there's a lot of empire building in there. A lot of new commands will be created and, and a lot of extra staffs and a lot of high commands. Well, do you contend stuff. that the military training, the child, or, or you can't <laughs> call him a child, the young man, the student, will receive under your program will be comparable or as good as the military training he'd receive? Yes, I absolutely do. If you stick to basic training, which is the only thing Congress ever authorized in Public Law 51, which is the basic mm -hmm. legislation behind this whole plan. That's what we used to call branch and material That's training. That's right, in the exactly. Yes. I see I have a comrade in arms <laughs> here. As a matter of fact, this whole scheme grew up through our belief that if you can take a young man and give him four years of college ROTC, six weeks of summer camp, and commission him as a second lieutenant to lead men in combat. You can certainly make a private out of a young man in the last two years of high school with a six-week summer camp. Now, it has worked in the past, <coughs> and I can't see why We used to make about. second lieutenants in 17 weeks. That's right. <laughs> and now, some pretty good ones, I might yeah. add. Now, Congressman, uh, you and your colleagues are freshmen a congressman. Yes. And uh, you're challenging some of these old timers who've been on the Armed Services Committee for 30 years. Now, what is there in your background that leads you to think that you might be an expert in this field? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm very humble about that whole thing. You see, as close as I can figure, Mr. Carl Vincent came into the Congress the day I was born. <laughs> we offered this plan to the Armed Services Committee for their study. 
We offered this plan to the American Legion for study. We have tried to work with all of these groups that exist as far as we possibly can. But we are very proud that the common sense, practical approach of our plan made it successful in carrying the voice vote and the televote on the floor of the House of Representatives meeting as the Committee of the Hall. Have you had training as a psychologist? Yes, I have. My college work is in psychology, and as a matter of fact, I was a personnel consultant on military duty have at you the start of my five-year service in World War II. All of us who drafted this plan, you see, have seen this thing, not from the standpoint of the boys with the stars and the boys with the white gold and the cups, but all of us have been on the underside, training men and being trained. That and is we not think true that gives us some perspective. <clears throat> By and large, the Armed Services Committee is composed of a majority of non-veterans. Now, sir, we'd like, uh, uh, finally, we'd like you to give us your prediction as to what will happen in this struggle between the two systems, the government and the one what you're advocating. Well, my prediction is that the American people are going to evidence a continued interest. We have never had a flood of mail such as we had on UMT. If the American people want an American plan of UMT instead of a European-Asiatic type plan, all they've got to do is let their own congressman know, and he's sitting down there waiting in Washington, waiting to hear from them, and he'll do what they want. Because in the wonderful American tradition, this is an election year. Well, thank you, Mr. Brownson. I'm sure that our audience has appreciated your views. Thank you for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Donald I. Rogers. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Charles B. Brownson, United States Representative from Indiana. Do you have the problem of selecting a gift of great prestige for someone important to you? That problem is most happily solved with Longine, the world's most honored watch. Because of the outstanding quality of the watch itself, and because of what the name Longines stands for. To the whole world, Longines stands as the only watch in history to win the highest of all awards 38 times at World's Fairs and International Expositions, including 10 grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Longines also stands for the watch of first choice in sports, aviation, science, and other fields of precise timing. Longines stands for the only watch to be classified first at the four great government observatories, Washington, Geneva, Q. Teddington, and Neuchâtel. The gift of great prestige for any important occasion is Longines, the world's most honored watch. And throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much. And yet, you may buy and own, or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world's honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.